Hello everyone. Uh, hope I'm audible to all of you. Can anyone, can anyone just comment and let me know if I'm audible so that we can continue with the session. Hello. Yeah. Am I audible to everyone? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with uh, the second lecture, the second session for the Road to DevSoc. So basically, today's session covers the foundations of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Yesterday, you all were able to get a brief idea of how to convert a concept to a product. So it is a project product management. Today, we'll start with uh, this is the basics of front end development. So yeah, uh, let's start with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So Okay, so what is HTML? So HTML basically, uh, uh, like it, it, the full form for HTML stands as hypertext markup language. It, it is the most basic building block of the web, you can say. And basically, HTML defines every structure that goes into the web development. And the other uh, the other technologies that uh, assist HTML to make the website responsive and functional uh, include C uh, CSS and JavaScript. So basically, the CSS. Uh, helps in the you know the appearance and presentation like how the web appears to the end user of the uh, website and javascript adds the functionality and behavior to the website so we will move on with the basic tags of html so the entire html is basically uh, contained in the two tags which is the html and the html slash so basically it's an open tag and a closed tag tag indicates uh, it basically tells the browser that this is the end of the HTML document and has to stop rendering anything from the uh, rendering. So it is the root element in which entire HTML code is written. Then comes the script tag. So basically whatever JavaScript is written or whatever JavaScript that goes is written into the script tag of the HTML tag. The next tag that we have is the style tag. So whatever CSS that we use for styling our goes into the style tag of the page. The next up that we have is the head tag. So basically all the metadata and other information about the HTML documents such as the title, character encoding. So basically character encodings uh, like UTF-8 and all of those go and uh, any link to the style sheets or scripts are given to the head uh, tag of the HTML. So basically the title that we have a look at during the of opening of the website is basically defined in the HTML uh, in the head tag of the HTML. So next up, we have the body tag. So basically, the body tag is the most important part of the HTML, uh, one of the most important tags of the HTML in which this basically the body tag will contain the entire content of the HTML, like whatever is displayed or rendered is basically contained in the body tag, in the body tag and whatever you want the end user to have a look at is content the body tag in simpler terms. Now the next up we have is H1 and H6. So basically these are the tags that are used for headings. So when you give a heading to your, it's like you want to give a heading say um, about us. So it basically define, you can basically define about us between H1 to H6. So it depends on your styling. So H1 is the highest uh, intensity of that particular heading, and H6 is the lowest, has the lowest intensity. The next up we have is the div tag. We'll have a project soon, so don't worry if you all are like, we'll have a project soon to implement all of those things. So, yeah, stay tuned. So, yeah, the next up we have is the div tag. Div tag, uh, basically, div tag is used for, uh, you know, better structuring and for rendering of the HTML pages like. You give containers like you have an about us so an entire about us is contained in one dev then we have the about us heading that's another like it basically helps you in it basically helps in the proper structuring of the html element the next up we have is the paragraph tag so paragraph tag basically uh it defines every paragraph so anything that is contained in the paragraph tag 
after which if there's a new paragraph tag, it'll leave a line and it'll start. So it's a paragraph tag simple. Then up we have the button. So button is nothing but a clickable button like you see in every uh, pages of the HTML. The next tag that we have is a span tag. So basically a span tag is nothing but it is just used to dis define some of the uh, properties like if you want to manipulate the style of a particular uh, say it's say suppose we have soft 23 so 23 is highlighted in blue so to highlight 23 into blue we use the span tag and 23 is included into the span tag so that you can just you know lay emphasis or you can just style that 23 so it other than that it does not have any significant importance so yeah the next up we have the image tag uh, this is used for including images the next is a a at a tag a tag uh, this is the hyperlink tag the link tag so this is uh, this creates basically a link to an external resource or also to a particular uh, you know a particular uh, div particular uh, container in your particular like in your own uh, web page it itself it basically links uh, your text or whatever is enclosed between the two a tags it links that tag to the external resource or the resource that you have already you want to show it in that particular container and the next up we have the input tag so the input tag is simply the as a word states it takes inputs from the user and it is used for sending info input to the form like yep so moving ahead the this is an example of a basic html code that uh, i've written for you all so basically as you see the start is with html and the end is with html the had uh, the header so this does not have any uh, particular styling or script or javascript included so we don't have any script or uh, style tags in this included in this the next up we have header so basically we've defined the title as hello world example the body which will contain the display contents of the website i've included hello world in the h1 tag which is of the highest intensity and i have included uh, the just another html tutorial and a paragraph tag so if you want like this is how this is going to be looking on the web. When you open this, it will look like. So as you see, the title uh, is given as hello world example, and it will be given as hello world. This is the H1 tag, the heading, the heading tag. And so it, as you can see, it's quite bold enough and it uh, appears as a heading to you all. So this is the advantages of using uh, heading tags in your HTML. So yeah, this is the hello world thing. And the next up, we have that paragraph tag which paragraph tag is nothing but just another HTML tutorial. So I just included that. So this is how the other, uh, you know, other content of the website included in the paragraphs look like. So moving ahead, now we'll move on to styling CSS, which, not, which is nothing but the cascading style sheets. So basically cascading style sheets are a style sheet language used to describe the presentation of your uh, document within the HTML. CSS describes how elements should be rendered on screen, on paper, in speech, or on other media. And we have a lot of CSS libraries these days, which people use like Bootstrap CSS, Tailwind CSS, Balma Foundation, and many more CSS libraries. So basically what the CSS libraries do is they reduce your work of, you know, writing the entire CSS code and the, like a, say a code of display flex just reduces to flex. So basically your effort that goes into uh, writing the CSS is reduced, but the functionality remains the same. So this is what the basic purpose of libraries is. And um, so like we'll move ahead with a few CSS properties to get a hold of. Okay, so the first up we have is the color property. This is used for setting the color of the text content, like the font, the paragraph. Say the paragraph which we had, if I said the color of like paragraph and color, the color of the paragraph to red. So then it will be uh, given as a red. So basically the text will appear red in color. The next up we have is font size. So this is nothing but used for, you know, displaying the font size of the text. Like if you to basically, you know, the size of the text, like you want to make it an H1 tag will have a particular font size H6 tags. So H1 tag has a predefined font size from the you know, HTML part of the thing. Uh, if you want to give a font size bigger than H1 tag, then you have to manually enter it. So next up, we have font family. Uh, this is basically uh, used for styling and all of those things. So you have Times, Times New Roman, Metropolis, and all of those font families. The next up we have is font weight. So font 
it basically defines how bold that element should be rendered on your uh, screen. So a font weight of 1000 is bold and uh, 400 is a bit less bold than 1000. Then comes bold, bolder and all of those things. Uh, so the next the, uh, next property that we have is text align. This is used for aligning the text uh, within its container horizontally. Basically text align, center, start, end. So uh, the, this is basically the proper, the CSS that the text, how the text should be rendered within that particular dev component. It is used for that. The next we have is text dec uh, decoration. So this is particularly used for adding visual effects like underline, strike through to a particular text. Like uh, like I'll just give an example, like uh, a href, like the a tag, which we learned href tag. That tag is particularly, that tag by default has whatever is enclosed, like the text that is enclosed within the tag has an underline in it. So if you want to remove the underline, you have to define explicitly that text decoration none. Then only the ahref tag will not have an underline uh, by default in it. So this is how the text should be decorated and it should be displayed to the uh, you know end user. So the background color simply says the background color of that particular element, nothing more. The next is the width. So this is uh, we explicitly this is used for setting the width of the element. The height is the height of the element. The margin, okay. So the margin is the space that that particular element should have from outside, like from other contents, the contents around it. So basically, if it's margin top and there's a depth container above it, it will, you know, uh, leave that that much amount of space from that above container, and then it will start its own rendering whatever it has inside it. So basically margin is used for that particular spacing around the element and padding is basically spacing inside the element. So if you give a padding top of say 10 pixels and the text whatever or whatever you went enclosed in that particular div container that will start after 10 pixels from where that div container starts. So it's it basically gives space inside of the container and margin gives space outside of the container. These this are the two main differences between margin and padding. The next up that we have is border. This is used for giving a border to the dev element. The next is display. So this is basically how your dev container should be displayed. It should be displayed in the block format, in the inline format, in the you know inline block format or whatever you want, or uh, like however you want it, it, that should be displayed that dev. The next up we have is a float. Uh, so this is used for positioning an element along the left or right of its container, allowing the text to wrap it. So basically, if there's a photo and if you want the text to wrap it or not, all of those things are controlled by the float property of the CSS. The next property is position property. This is used for defining the position of an element within a div or you know the position of the div with respect to the main element, like the main HTML. The Z index basically determines the stacking out of the positioned elements. So if you want to stack a uh, element to one above the other, you need to set the Z index accordingly. Uh, so basically it is used for 3D rendering, kind of 3D rendering of that particular thing. The Z index is introduced rather than only the X and Y axis. The next up we have the opacity. So opacity, like the term states, it, it is basically used to define the transparency of the level, like how opaque should that particular thing be like if you set a low opacity then that particular thing will be transparent like it will have a faded appearance on the website on the web page the next is transition so basically this this is used for transition effects and it basically is like easy or like when you open a web browser there are sometimes proper like everything does not load appropriately right there are some things load after some delay so those things are set up by the transition property of the css the next that we have is box shadow. So this is basically uh, the shadow that the box renders on the HTML document. So basically if you give the box shadow, it will be like, uh, there'll be a shadow outside of that div container, like that, that div container will be rendered and then there'll be a shadow behind it. So you can set various properties of that particular box shadow. Like you can have uh, where it should be displayed, how, what, and there are a lot of uh, things that go into it, but it's a good useful property for styling. The next that we have is border radius. This is used to define how sharp the radius of your border should be. So basically if I increase the radius of the border, the corners of the border become rounded. And if I keep it intact, the it will be just a straight and a drop. So basically 
uh, it's just used to define how cornered your border should be. And this, so basically these are a few tags that I've mentioned. There are a lot of many more tags which you can go through in the documentation of CSS. So this is a very important box CSS box model, which is used for styling of the components. So uh, whenever you're developing a thing, whenever you're in the phase of development, you inspect an element and you have a CSS box model rendered just at the bottommost uh, part of that element part in the inspect element. So I'll just explain like how this box model works and how what basically this comprehends is. So you see the dotted line outside that particular indicate that particular thing indicates the margin of that uh, you know top margin tm is top margin rm is right margin lm is left margin vm is uh, you know uh, water margin so basically it uh, defines how much it should be uh, associated like how much space should it leave before it starts rendering its own content the next up that is the border so basically border the, the, of course, there's no border as thick, but there's a space given for that particular thing. Like if there's any border, it will be displayed like border. Then there's padding after border, like padding is then always given inside of the border. So the, uh, if they, if even if you've not made a border visible, uh, there's, there's always a border around it. It's almost negligible. You cannot see, of course, but uh, padding starts from that. And after padding, you have the content. So this is how rendering of the styles and you know web pages take place uh, on the web. So basically, this is a very very useful model that you will uh, come across while development, and you generally change properties using the CSS box model, and you come to know how much uh, spacing you need to increase or decrease. So yeah, so this is how uh, you you know Control Shift I, and then you uh, see this particular thing the a CSS box mode. So this is the margin that it's leaving. It's not leaving any margin. So it's a minus like dash dash. It's not leaving any uh, border. It does not have any border. It does not have any padding. It only has a content. So 9, 12, cross 14. So it's basically the, you know, the width cross height, it's always written like that. So the content, how much space the content is occupying, it's particularly it's written like that. And this is how, uh, you know, a CSS box mode looks like in actual web development. Yeah. So now moving ahead, like we've learned a lot about how HTML, like how to build an HTML page and how to style an HTML page. But the web page is of no use if there's no functionality added to it. So this is the the most important part of web development, you can say, which is JavaScript. This basically adds functionality to everything that goes into your, uh, you know, your web page. So JavaScript is abbreviated as JS and it's a programming language tool uh, that is one of the core technologies of the World Wide Web, which is WWW. Uh, alongside HTML and CSS, it you know it allows the developers to add interactivity and dynamic behavior. Also, it, the most important part is the functionality of the websites. Uh, they, we also have different kinds of libraries in JavaScript, which are ReactJS, Next.js, Angular, Vue, and many more libraries. So these libraries, the most used libraries these days is the Next.js, which is the latest library that is developed in JavaScript. It's uh, based on React.js, but uh, I'll not go into much of the technicalities for that because yeah, uh, we are focusing on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and not its libraries. So yeah, but we have uh, many sessions coming up, so stay tuned. Yeah, so basically I'll just go through the JavaScript syntax like how you write JavaScript. So basically JavaScript values, uh, you define JavaScript values. So there are two types, basically literals and variables. So literals have fixed values and basically variables have variable values. So if you defined a literal, you cannot change its value anywhere in the entire program and variables can be changed anywhere that you wish. Uh, some of the widely used, uh, you know, literals are numbers, strings, booleans, object, array, etc. So numbers is, as it states, they are numbers. Strings is basically a string uh, elements. The Boolean is basically a true or false value and basically an object element and an array element. So like I've just written numbers can be written in from decimal places or it cannot even have decimal places. String literals are enclosed within double, double quotes or a single quote, it depends. There is no, you know, compulsion of, uh, 
enter it, like uh, you know enclosing it within a single quote. But you have to make sure that if you start it with a single quote, then you should not end it with a double quote. Uh, it should be ended with the same quote that you're starting it with. And Boolean literals have you know positive uh, true or false value as simple. The object variables are basically listed. So basically, an object variable is like a dictionary. It basically, if you write, um, I have given an example of an object, say name, John, age 30, and city New York. So if I want to render, I give the this object a name as, a, a, you know, user details. So if I type as user details dot name, I'll get the name as John. So basically, it is quite, you know, it's quite useful for developers uh, to access key value pairs. Uh, so this is an object. Uh, arrays are basically like normal arrays that you have square brackets and you write whatever you want inside it. So in a programming language, variables are used to store data values. So as uh, everybody is aware, and JavaScript uses the keywords where, la, uh, let, and constant to declare these variables. So var basically stands for variable. Let is let, uh, just like the word means, and constant is basically a constant. Like you cannot change its value. Or during the entire execution of the program and an equal sign is used to assign values to the variables so yeah um, i'll just explain like what are var so variables declared with var have function scope or global scope depending on where they are declared uh, they can be uh, reassigned and redeclared within their scope so basically there are different like if you uh, if you've described a variable defined a variable outside of a function then it's going to have a global scope for that particular function like you can access that variable inside of that function but if you define a variable inside a function you cannot access that variable outside of that function because that particular variable is assigned like that particular variable's role is just the local scope uh, so this is how the scopes are so let so variables declared with let are limited to the block in which they are defined and they can be reassigned within their scope but not redeclared so basically if you are within that scope you can you know reassign but you cannot redeclare that particular variable like if you have given as let um, you know let a equal to 10 you cannot again you know describe as let a equal to this you can just type it as a equal to 5 you can you know reassign the value but you cannot redeclare that particular thing uh, the next up is constant so basically constant uh, cannot the val values of the constant cannot be changed during the entire execution of the particular code. So if you have defined a value of constant, then it needs to be hard coded at that particular place only. You cannot, you know, change it at a later point in the program. So basically constants should be used with uh, utmost care. Uh, the next that we have is like how JavaScript for JavaScript functions, like how are JavaScript functions written and the syntax for the JavaScript function. So a uh, JavaScript function is a block of a code uh, designed to uh, perform a particular task. Uh, a JavaScript function is executed when something invokes it. Like whenever you call that particular function, only then it renders. It does not have a property. Like it will render in key, but it's not a property to render on its own. Something needs to invoke the JavaScript function. So the syntax goes as function. The function, the word needs to be written. The name of that particular function, if there are any parameters that need to be passed with along with it, then parameter one to like how many other parameters you have, you pass it. Uh, you have curly braces within which the code is you know written. Uh, it is not necessary for a function to have a written statement, and it depends on our purpose whether that function is just for uh, uh, for you know doing something or it needs to return something. It depends on the purpose of the function. So, sorry, it's not mandatory for a function to you know have a written statement uh, the next that we have is okay so we'll be uh, in the last 10 minutes so you, if you have any doubts just keep them uh, yeah so okay so javascript arrow function so this is a very important part when it comes to web development because uh, you know you use uh, arrow functions during web development arrow functions are the things that you're going to use most frequently so just pay keen attention to what arrow functions are and how it is. So basically arrow functions allow us to write a shorter function syntax. So basically const, uh, how arrow func the syntax of the arrow function goes as constant function name equal to parameters that you want to pass within that particular thing. And that's 
than equal to and uh, you know uh, less than or greater than whatever sign you say that that particular sign so basically it you know forms kind of an arrow and you have a uh, uh, you know curly braces within which the function is written so i've just given an example say constant say hello equal to this does not have any parameter uh, and it just console logs hello so whenever i invoke the function say hello it's going to uh, log on my console hello so this is how cons uh, you know arrow functions work in javascript so basically they are used uh, for short shorter function syntax and uh, they're used for a better functionality so yeah moving ahead uh, we have loops in javascript uh, like every programming language has loops so what are loops so loops are used for you know continuing that particular piece of code repeatedly until you set until your condition is satisfied or until uh, you know all of the data is printed say you have 100 users in your list and you want to print all of the users you're not going to you know write the function say 100 times you're going to run a loop so that it runs for 100 times and then it stops so loops uh, are particularly used for you know reiterating that part, that part of the function again and again till your condition is satisfied so we have different kinds of loops uh, depending on the purpose and uh, you know your functionality for in javascript so they are for loops while loop and do while loop so i'll just explain what a for loop is so for loop uh, is you know like as the name defines for so you have to you know for i'll just say int i i is less than equal to 10 and i plus plus so basically this means that i'll start at and uh, you know let i so i'll start at an uh, i i is a you know variable so i'll start at i so it will start at zero then it will run the particular function and then it will again come onto the for loop till the value of i is less than 10. so this particular function runs for 10 times uh, before it moves on to the next part of the code so it, it, like i mentioned if you have a users you know you're not going to uh, you know write or uh, write or call the function or invoke the function 100 times not going to write 100 lines uh, because there are possibilities that the users increase or the their users have deleted their accounts so then there will be errors so that's when the for loop comes so you will run that for loop uh, for you know the length of that particular array so it will then keep rendering and this is how for loops function so they're used for uh, you know, run through a block of code a number of times. Coming up with while loops. So while loops are executed till the, uh, you know, specified condition is true. As soon as the specified condition becomes false, you exit the loop. So while i is less than 10 and I keep iterating the value of i inside of the while loop. So you have to keep in mind that you you just pass, uh, you know, if uh, like you just pass a condition in the while and a condition. Uh, so while the condition is true, it will keep iterating through the loop and as soon as the condition is false it will just you know uh, exit the code now a uh, do while loop is just a you know it has a small functionality change on the while loop and it is useful of uh, many many times uh, when while loop does not come handy so this also loops to the block of code while a specified condition is true so you know this basically uh, this basically first runs the code and then it checks for the condition like you do that while this is true so even if your condition is false it will run through the code once before it exits the code because the while statement that if the condition is true or false is checked uh, at a later stage so that is what the do while statement basically does uh, moving ahead uh, javascript promise so this is uh, apparently one of the most important topics in javascript uh, you know for your web development that you should know because moving ahead in time, you're going to work with a lot of, you know, APIs and all of those things. So while working with APIs, uh, promises, async functions and await and all of those things I'll be covering. So basically these, these are the things that are most important. So basically I'll just define what the JavaScript promises. So like the word promise as it means in the real world, uh, you know, promise is an object that represents a promise of a future result. So if I, you know, promise that I'm going to give you 10 rupees tomorrow, so you know you are going to uh, wait like you are going to get a result of ten like you are going to get ten rupees tomorrow. But I have promised that I am going to give it tomorrow. So it is a way of you know handling uh, actions that take time. So I am going to give you tomorrow. But how are you 
for sure that I'm going to give you to you tomorrow only. So that is because I've made a promise to you. So that is what JavaScript promises basically do. Whenever you are fetching a request from an API, it is going to be immediate if the APIs are fast, but you need to have a margin of time. Like there, there, there is going to be a fraction of a second while it fetches from the, you know, the API, it goes to the API route and fetches the information. But till that time, if you've not, you know, described through promise and all, there's going to be an immediate error that a JavaScript function throws because it will not know that I have to wait for, you know, the API request to come and it is then going to give me something. So basically a promise function basically tells the, you know, JavaScript program that I'm promising you that I'm going to get you something from the API. You have to wait till that time and you don't have to go ahead. So this is how you know, promise works. So there are two conditions in promise. Either your is uh, accepted and fulfilled or your promise is rejected. So like you cannot deliver that particular promise. So you fail. Yes. Like uh, you do not success. Yeah, sorry. So basically, um, um, yeah, hmm. sorry. So basically, uh, it basically means that you're going to fulfill the promise or you're going to reject the promise. Like I do not give you 10 rupees tomorrow, say. So you reject the promise. So like the promise is I could not deliver that particular thing. So the promise is rejected. So basically in terms of, you know, programming, it's called fulfillment and rejection. Moving ahead, we have is JavaScript async. So this is what basically promise functions are, you know, like I just explained what JavaScript promises, but how to implement promises is through the JavaScript async function. So async uh, keyword is used to define an asynchronous function. Uh, you know, an asynchronous function is a special type of function that allows you to write asynchronous code in a more readable and sequential manner. It enables you to write code that can perform tasks asynchronously without blocking the execution of other code. So just giving an example, like uh, I requested for the API to send information, but unfortunately, if the API is not able to send information, so, and despite that, if you've not defined async or you've not done anything and you have written say constant E equal to E dot data, the API failed to respond. Like the API rejected the request, you know, so you will not have anything as a dot data. And then there'll be an, you know, uh, error thrown by the function that we do not get anything as a dot data, E dot data. So this is where JavaScript async functions come into handy. They basically help you, uh, async functions basically themselves define, uh, like if you've passed async function, I just show how to write async functions just a normal before the arrow function, like before the, you know, the brackets, you write async, that's it. So basically it itself tells the program that you are, there's a promise involved here. I am going to go and fetch the API, but if you not get the API, then you have to execute the other part of the code and not this. And that is the reason we use a try catch, uh, you know, a try catch block with async. So try catch is basically used for like, try this. And if there's catch basically stands for error. So if there's the promises rejected by the API, it goes into the catch block of the statement. Like there's an error that is caught. The promise is not fulfilled, so it's, it's caught. So it's like that, it's try and catch. So I'll just move ahead. You'll uh, understand it better. This is what JavaScript. So what is await? So it's like we we, we told the function that, okay, it, you have to wait, uh, like there's a promise involved here. You have to wait till, it you know goes to the api and it fetches information and comes back but what like while it goes and comes back if i define await it means that the program will stand there till the time it has you know received the information from the api it will not keep it will not you know move ahead with any other of the code so this is where this is where await functions come into picture and you have to keep in mind that await functions can only and only be used in an async function. So await is not a function, okay? So await can only be used only and only in an async function. So it's a keyword, await is just a keyword. So yeah, you need to keep in mind if you just pass await in any other random function, it is not going to accept because it does not have any promise involved with it. Involved with it. If there's a promise, then only I'll wait. So I, it's the example that I gave you, if I'm going to give you 10 rupees tomorrow, you're going to wait. So that is what await basically does. You're going to wait for, you know, till tomorrow that, yeah, he's going to give me 10 rupees. If uh, if I have not given you any promise, you're going to approach someone else. So there you cannot use the function await. 
so that is what await does moving ahead to so basically this is you know a short simple representation or a syntax of our javascript async await function looks like so we're using the arrow function here as you know constant fetch user equal to async as you see async keyword comes into the picture user id the try and the catch block like i mentioned you try so basically if the promise is fulfilled it will go into the try because promise is fulfilled right so then it will try so your promise is fulfilled of me giving you 10 rupees then you will go and try buying something from that 10 rupees right and if the promise is uh, you know rejected of like if the promise fails if i fail my promise of giving you 10 rupees then you will do catch an error like you will do go to someone else for 10 rupees so basically you've caught an error so basically that is what it is and console dot log error so basically that is this is how uh, you know a typical uh javascript async can await functions are written as so await fetch data user id so this is going to wait until i get the data from the user okay and if i don't get the data from the user it's going to move into the catch block so it it's going to it's telling the function that please wait i am fetching the data so it basically tells the line on which the data is going to come by you know letting it know that you have to wait here okay so this is okay so moving ahead i have just added a gif so basically this is a real world example you know a close real world example of how javascript async and await functions work so there is like a chef involved and a person like i want to eat pasta and i tell the chef that i want to eat pasta so the chef tells that i don't have uh, oil and i have to go and get it from the market so i go and get it there's a promise that i made to the chef so you know i'll just run the gif and you'll be able to understand it's like hey tim i'm making some pasta but i don't have olive oil would you run to the market and get so you are yeah sure but i will take some time so it's mentioned that it's an asynchronous function not an issue i will wait for you so now you know the process is that okay i will wait so he will prepare some rice like now the thing is success he got the oil he will start cooking but he did not find the oil then there is a failure which will move into the catch block so then it will be like uh you know it will move into the catch block then the chef will not be able to cook pasta and uh, he has to just you know uh, say sorry and move out that he cannot cook pasta because he does not have oil so this is how an is uh, you know async and await functions work uh please keep in mind that async await functions have a lot of importance and reliability in uh, you know fetching apis and in a lot of future libraries so get async and await you know concepts clear in your mind if you all have any doubts we'll have the doubt session where you can ask doubts moving ahead so dom so what is javascript dom so basically this is a document object model when a web page is loaded the browser creates a document object model and the dom provides a way to interact with and manipulate the web page so you can manipulate the web page through uh, you know the uh, javascript function so moving ahead so this is how uh, you know a rendering of a dom is done so this is the document this is the root element the html and then it is distributed into head and body so body will have you know a a tag as a chari f chari f basically links with where it has with where it has to go this is an element this is an element h1 and this is the entire body tag and this is the entire head tag okay so this is how it uh, basically the document object model looks like moving ahead so what are the different document object models so it's the get element by id so whenever you pass document dot get element by id and you pass in the id you will get you will you know have that have the access to that particular uh, function like you will have access to that particular uh, element of that id next we have is doc get elements by class name the most important thing to note here is this will return an array of elements and then if you want to use the first element because class names uh, there can be a like you know you can have the same class name given to multiple uh, uh, objects but you cannot have an id so id is unique but class names can be multiple so this will return an array and you can you know use zero and use that particular class name moving ahead is tag name so tag name is basically dev a h r e f basically you pass a tag name and you have access to that particular element so even this is elements because there can be multiple elements with that particular tag, tag name the query selector is basically it is nothing uh, different but it is basically the uh, use sorry yeah it will use the first element that matches the specified css selector so if i pass in the selector here 
it's going to go through the entire uh, document of the model and it's going to get you the first uh, you know the first element that is going to match match uh, that particular selector the next is query selector call so query selector call is nothing but uh, you know it basically the query selector just got you that one or uh, the first element that it found but query selector all will get you all the elements that match particular css selector so even this will be an array which will have all the elements and you can uh, you know get hold of that particular arrays um, say like you of you know returning of an array like rendering like you pass a, a zero in square bracket so that is how you access the particular elements of the array so that is how you can then go ahead uh, create element basically you know creates an element in that particular part it basically uh, you want to create an element at the end of the you know after entire thing is done and i press a button you want to show something so then an element should be created so create element uh, tag name is passed so uh, you know you'll have a tag name out there so you pass div so div tag will be created at the end the next is append child so it appends a child to another element like you pass the child element here and it will append the child to the parent element is basically the element in which you want to append that particular child the parent element if you want to remove that particular child you can remove set attribute is basically like there's an image so image will have attributes like src and a lot more on click and all of those things so if you want to set a uh, src basically represents the source from where the image should be you know fetched so if you want to later at a later stage in time define or you want to use javascript dom and define the source then you have to you know use that you have to get get the image element and set attribute src comma the value of the src you set the at attribute get attribute basically you know gets the attribute like if i uh, i just set the image src attribute so if i want to get the src attribute like what what is the src uh, value what what value does it have it will give me the value uh, event listener is basically adding uh, use for adding you know listeners like event name so element dot event, add event listener basically click uh, hover and all of those things are you know uh, used for event uh, like event name and event handler so basically event handler is a function of which is to be run after uh, like after the that particular event is after like if i click what should be run so that is event handler the class list is basically used for manipulating the css classes so basically i'll just uh, have an example of how class list works so basically uh, i'll just explain so class list is you know you add a class list a class name remove toggle contain so basically this is used for manipulating the css okay yeah moving ahead this is an example of a javascript dom so here you will see a uh, heading dot class list dot toggle so whenever you keep uh, you know pressing the button it is going to keep toggling that particular css so this is what a uh, event listener does oh uh, sorry this is what the class list does it basically manipulates the styles uh, given to a particular element so i took that element i took the heading and i am head uh, i'm changing the uh, you know uh, the property of heading to toggle like if i click the button it has a toggle it has to keep toggling so this makes my life a lot easier with javascript like i just have to pass class list dot toggle and it automatically handles all the cases of true false whether i have toggled it before whether it is visible no it automatically does that so yeah this is what javascript dom model is and to just give an idea okay so basically before moving ahead i'd like to uh, like we'll just i'll just share my screen and i'll show my project that we made so yeah okay so this is uh, is my screen visible yeah okay so my screen is visible so i'll just you know uh give me a sec sorry Hello, yeah. 
So this is the project that I'm going to share. Yeah, my screen is a bit right. Okay. So first and first, we'll go to the HTML page that is there. So this is nothing but just to give an idea, this is a counter function. Uh, this basically counts, you know. Okay, so plus, minus, and reset. It's counter function, simple. So this is the HTML tag in which, uh, you know, the entire HTML should be rendered. So this is the closing tag and this is the opening tag. Then next up, we have the head, uh, head tag, which contains all of the, you know, like what should be there. So basically the title is given as counter, the link rel style sheet, href. So basically this will, you know, indicate that you have to, this is a style sheet. So basically the link tag basically tells the HTML document that uh, we have a style sheet in the href for that particular style sheet. Is, uh, so the HRF for that particular style sheet is index.css. If I follow this link, you'll see that it basically redirects to index.css. But one thing that you need to make sure in this is that the index.css and index.html should be in the same file. Otherwise, you'll have to define the entire route. Okay. Uh, in the same folder. I'm sorry. In the same folder. Uh, otherwise, you have to define the entire route. So, yeah. It basically indicates that you have to go here and fetch all of the styles that are implemented. So yeah, so like you can see, this is the main div container, which is going to have entirely everything enclosed within it. So this I have named as class as container. Okay. Then I have put up the image. SRC is basically the source, the CC logo, the Coach F logo. So it, it means that it's going to fetch the coach have to go the alt tag so what is the alt attribute so basically alt attribute is whenever the user is using you know a, a you know a retarded version of web or whenever there's an internet issue and the web page has loaded but the image is not able to you know fetch or render itself or anything of the like if there's any case where the image is not able to render itself alt is something that will be displayed it's the tag it's it's basically the text that will be displayed so if uh, the image is not visible, it will dismiss CodeChef logo. And class is CC logo. So I've used this for you know the styling properties of different class. Now I've included a counter app in the H1 tag, which is the heading tag. The next that I have defined another container for you know the counter properties only. So this has a button which is for implement, a div which is you, you know going to show like with, what is the value of this particular thing, and a decrement button which is minus. And then there will be a last button also of the deck, which is reset. If I click on reset, it will you know, reset to zero. And the most important, how this thing is going to work will be only determined by the script tag. If you have not mentioned the script tag, uh, your functionality won't be working. It will just be a simple web page that will have just, you know, styling to it. So yeah, the script can be added in the head as well. I added in the body. It doesn't not make much of a difference, but yeah. Uh, so script. So basically this is going to tell the, you know, the HTML element that um, where should I get the script? So it basically stays at counter.js. I click on it and redirect to counter.js. So it tells the HTML document that I have to get all my functionalities from counter.js. Okay. Moving ahead, I'll just explain the CSS of this. Uh, so, you know, this is how it is. So dot counter. So what was counter? Counter, uh, yeah. So counter is this basically this. Uh, wait, yeah. Sorry. So yeah, this. What is this? So basically, star and uh, curly brackets basically determine the entire HTML document. It doesn't uh, get. You know, it. It is. Uh, it does not depend on any class name. It, it basically means I have to render this particular styles to the entire uh, thing, like the entire the main HTML document. So I've given as box sizing as border box. Uh, the margin. I don't want any margin. I don't want the main HTML element to you know leave space from the web and start. So I've given margin zero, padding zero, and I've set the background color. Coming to dot container. Okay. So flex. So basically flex is, you know, a flex box kind of a display. Uh, you can uh, have a look at it in the documentation. There are dis different kinds of display, like it will block, inline block, flex. So flex gives a lot of functionality, you know, a lot of uh, stretching and all of those things you can do with a container. Flex direction basically tells in which direction all of the elements in that particular uh, 
container should be rendered. So I have given column. So it will be rendered in a column. So basically, all of the things, all of these particular elements will be rendered in a column and not in a row. If I just change this to row, we'll see that all of these appear like in a straight line. I have given column, so they'll appear column by column. The CC logo, I've given margin to it. I've given margin top uh, specifically because I explicitly wanted to leave a not explicitly wanted that it should leave a you know more space from the top rather than from other sides. So yeah, and the height. So basically the height of that particular logo. Coming ahead, dot container h1. So the thing is, like the container only had uh, you know one h1 tag. If it had multiple h1 tags, it will apply this property to all h1 tags. So make sure you don't uh, you know move that thing up. So yeah, yeah. Sorry. So yeah, the dot container space h1 basically means that I'm assigning all of my CSS to this particular tag this counter app. Okay, so what I have done, I have added width to it, I have added display flex, and I have justified the content to center, like whatever uh, space that dev element occupies, I want that uh, it should be located in the center. That is what it is. Moving ahead, uh, so yeah, the point is, uh, see you can, as you, as you can see, these are IDs, and these are classes. So for referencing into CSS, Classes are referenced with dot and the class name, and IDs are referenced with hashtag and the uh, ID name. Okay, so just keep this in mind. And if you have multiple IDs which need to have the same property, it's fine. You can just use comma and uh, curly braces, and you can do. You don't need to, you know, uh, hashtag increment button give properties again. Hashtag increment or uh, decrement button give CS properties. So you can just you you put a comma and you know write all of those. Uh, uh, classes or IDs that need to have that particular style. So I'll give the height, the width, the padding, the border radius. So uh, you will be able to, I'll just explain it in the output as well, like how the border radius, you'll be able to see that there's a border, a thick border that appears, the background color of the button, the border. So solid basically uh, defines that the border should be either solid or dotted or dashed. So, you know, a dotted border will basically be like dot 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 and then will be border so that is how it is there's a color of the border uh this is the color of the text that is within it and there's a margin this is the properties that i've given to the reset button uh the styling that i've given to the reset button and this is the increment button is to hover this is a very important thing that i want you all to know so what does this do so whenever i you know move on to the increment button it's going to activate this that uh, double dots hover, like colon hover basically in indicates that whenever I hover over the increment button, decrement button, and reset button, the this particular uh, styles should be added only during that time. And whenever I, you know, uh, hover away from the particular thing, the style should be, you know, eradicated. So this is how the I've put like the cursor should be pointer. And this is the container value, like, you know, this particular thing, like, okay, this thing, like, uh, the styles for that I have, you know, added. Moving ahead, the most important part, the functionality is this. I have assigned a counter zero, let counter equal to zero. I have accessed the counter value through document.get element by ID. And I have assigned the name counter value. I will assign the name increment button. And I basically got all of that properties in the increment button thing. And using query selector, I've used a reset because I'm going to add an event listener. While adding event listeners, query selector, you know, makes your life easier if you want to add event listeners. So yeah, remember that. Uh, yeah, so I have used reset. So you can see this is the reset and this is the reset thing. Okay, so increment button, this thing, if I have added an event listener to it, like if I have clicked it, like if it is clicked, you can see there's an arrow, arrow function used here. Uh, like I mentioned the importance of the arrow function. So yeah, this is what it has to do. So it has to do counter plus plus. So I'll just uh, explain what counter plus plus is. So counter plus plus is nothing but count, uh, you know, counter equal to counter plus one. So basically uh, it is a shorthand property for this uh, thing only. So yeah, just uh, make sure that you know this and okay. So yeah. Moving ahead, uh, we have, okay, so I increment as a counter, but how should the, you know, counter value know that I've incremented it. So I am doing counter value, 
which I got. This is the counter value. You see, I am taking that and uh, I'm changing its inner HTML to the value of the counter. So inner HTML is basically this. Whatever is enclosed within it is the inner HTML. Okay, yeah. The same goes with the decrement button. I'm just doing counter minus minus here, and here it is. The add event listener reset. So what is reset going to do? Okay, so you can uh, you know use an arrow function here. It doesn't mind. I just want to show you if you don't want to use an arrow function, how you can go ahead. So yeah, this is what the thing is. Like I have defined a function reset. So if you don't want to use arrow functions, even this is a method through which you can do using arrow functions. Uh, it makes your life much easier. It reduces, you know, you can see it reduces four lines of unnecessary code. So yeah, uh, counter equal to zero. I've said and the inner HTML to counter. Okay. Uh, so this is the thing I'll just, uh, you know, share my, uh, I'll just share the output of this thing and I'll show you how it appears. So, okay. Yeah. So my screen is visible, right? Okay, so this is how. Uh, so uh, my screen is visible, right? Okay, so this is how. Uh, is my screen visible? Can anybody comment and let me know? Okay, I'll just uh, share it again. Yeah, it's now visible. Okay, yeah. So sorry for the delay. Yeah. So I'll just show you the functionality like plus, plus, plus. It's increasing. Minus, minus. You see, I added the cursor pointer. So my cursor basically becomes a pointer as soon as I hover over the buttons. You see, this is what uh, basically the hover property helps you to do minus. I do reset. Nothing because it is zero. I do minus minus plus I do reset it becomes it comes to zero so this is how you know the functionality has been implemented and added or uh, to you know your web page I'll just show you the inspect element and I'll show you like you can see so basically this step if I press you can see that this step is covering this this height and width so it basically turns blue as you can see so this is how it is uh, so Thank you guys. Uh, we can now move ahead with questions and doubts if I'll have any. So yeah, I hope it was an informative session. Or uh, before before we move on to doubts, I just have one thing to show y'all. So you know, uh, as y'all are aware, DevSoc is Southeast Asia's largest student run. Uh, is my screen visible? Wait, I just... Okay, so I'll just give you an uh, idea of what uh, DevSoc is. So DevSoc is Southeast Asia's largest student-run hackathon and to have a hands-on experience of whatever you've learned in this session and all of the sessions that are going to uh, come up next, uh, you can it's the best opportunity that you can have so uh, this is it uh, uh, you had a session yesterday and there are a lot of sessions that are lined up so just stay tuned to the coach vip channel and there'll be a lot of sessions that will be upcoming uh, which will you know pave you the way to devsoc 23 and will make your life a lot easier when you actually come and develop things during devsoc so yeah moving ahead with uh, questions if you have any doubts you can ask yeah, so I can see Aman asked a question is making a website same for phone and desktop. Okay, so like uh, uh, if you're talking about the responsiveness, so this is a very important parameter that I would like to tell you all. So basically, CSS has a property called at media screen and max width only. So you'll come to know about it. So uh, that particularly helps you in, you know, uh, 
designing the CSS for smaller screens or larger screens. But the thing is, whenever you use properties like padding 20 pixels, so it basically uh, adapts itself in such a way. The browser knows that padding 20 pixel means that 20 pixels of that particular screen width. So if my screen is 1880 pixels, it's going to consider 20 pixels in that particular respect and it's going to adjust itself in that particular manner. So using padding and margin and all those things is a lot beneficial. So yeah, I hope I've answered a question, Aman. Uh, we can move ahead with other questions. Are there any other questions? I had seen Shaurya asking a few questions like, uh, Shaurya, if you want, uh, you can just ask him. Okay, uh, I see there are uh, no questions coming. Uh, like, just ask one more time, are there any questions? Okay, I see no more questions coming up. Okay, so thank you guys. So I just like to inform you all that stay tuned to Coach IIT channel. Tomorrow also we have a session coming up. So we have a lot of many sessions lined up and yeah. So to learn and you know, embrace your skills and give them a try, you need to register for DevSoft, which will be starting soon. Uh, yeah, so DevSoft 23 will help you have a hands-on experience of whatever you learn in these sessions. So yeah, stay tuned to Coach VIT channel. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you.